Welcome to On Contact. Today we discuss the importance of the scholar Edward Said with Professor Hamid Dabashi. Edward's uh, insight into the constitution of the Oriental is identical with James Baldwin, with W.E.B. Du Bois, with all of these giants of intellectuals of, uh, of, of African American experience, with the idea that W.E.B. Du Bois called uh, double consciousness of, of African American. We too, we, we will create the way we saw ourselves. I'm following from W.E.B. Du Bois' revolutionary insight and the way that Europeans told us how we are. So we need to place Edward Said in a larger frame of reference. Yes, his insight was exceptionally revolutionary, liberating, not just people in the Arab and Muslim world, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the whole movement of subaltern studies, but also bring it back to the United States and experience that today we see in Black Lives Matter, in Native American uh, history, uh, etc. Every empire, as Edward Said points out, in its official discourse, has said that it is not like all the others, that its circumstances are special, that it has a mission to enlighten, civilize, bring order and democracy, and that it uses force only as a last resort. And sadder still, Said reminds us, there always is a chorus of willing intellectuals to say calming words about benign or altruistic empires as if one shouldn't trust the evidence of one's eyes, watching the destruction and the misery and death brought by the latest Mission Civilitrice. As Said knew, Western civilization is a fiction. Neither the term Orient nor the concept of the West has any ontological stability. Non-Western civilizations were and are invented constructs. Negational formulations of the Western world, used not to understand or explore reality, but to justify pillage and domination. Joining me to discuss the fictions those in the West tell themselves about themselves, and how these fictions are used to justify inflicting suffering and violence on others, is Hamid Dabashi, author of On Edward Said, Remembrance of Things Past, and professor of Iranian studies and comparative literature at Columbia University. So as I mentioned before we went on the air, I reread Orientalism, uh, which is a an explosive book. We forget how it uh, reconfigured the way we speak about imperialism, colonialism. Uh, I think without question one of the seminal texts of political science of the 20th century uh, and, and just lay out its importance for us. Uh, thanks Chris for having me. As you said it is important for us to reimagine 1978 when Edward Said for the first time published uh, or Orientalism. Uh, the book was very much the result or the aftershock of the 1973 Arab-Israeli war. Uh, as you know, at the time, Edward was a professor of English and comparative literature here in Colombia. And the uh, perception, the media, the, uh, in fact, the passage that you just cited from his, uh, uh, conception of a what he called a sayer intellectuals as opposed to naysayer intellectuals is precisely what Trump uh, prompted him to start sitting and, and writing Orientalism. To be sure, there were other critical thinkers like Anwar Abdul Malik and uh, others who had kind of hinted at the idea of uh, knowledge and power. And also, there were other thinkers before Edward Said, Nietzsche, and Foucault, etc., who had talked about this. But uh, Edward Said put a, such a potent political uh, force into the argument, in the, uh, uh, writing from Colombia, writing from New York, writing from the heart of American uh, empire, intellectual heart of American empire, if one can, is a contradiction in terms of intellectual heart of an empire. Uh, it became explosive, and at the time I was a graduate student at Penn, and uh, when, when I read it for the first time. It, as I say in my book on, on Edward Said, it had a liberating effect on generations of immigrant intellectuals like me, who were uh, born and raised in the context. I mean, uh, I was born in 1951. I, I was two years old when Americans staged the coup of 1953 in my country. 
So anytime anybody tells me, go back where you came from, I say, excuse me, you came to me before I, I came, before I came to right, you. That's right. So as a, as, a, as a child of the 1953 coup, I was born with the horrors of empire and the horrors of staging coups, which we just saw. Americans were trying to stage a coup in their own country. Uh, the, the language of uh, the intellectual, moral, imaginative language of Orientalism was liberating for not just me, people coming from Latin America, from Africa, from Asia. This is the significance of the book that many things that we knew had happened suddenly had a potent political and ideological language with which to begin to talk. So I, as I always say, you don't become Saidian. Said liberates you to begin to talk your own uh, Gramscian inventory of who it is that you are. What I found fascinating rereading the book uh, and he begins, you know, way back in the 1500s, is that the argument for or the justification of empire never changes. It doesn't change when the British uh, go into India or, or Egypt or, or when we go into Iraq. It's always the same mythological celebration of a fictitious culture and, and the negation of another. Uh, the, even the words are the same and lay out what that is. And it's a very dangerous construct uh, because what it really is is about uh, attempting to morally justify the suppression uh, and uh, subjugation of the other in the name of a moral order. Chris, it is a conspiracy theory before we had conspiracy theory, namely the construction of a mythology that suddenly from uh, classic antiquity to Hebrew Bible, all the way comes, is a Hegelian, comes uh, to, uh, a, through a teleological progression, comes to the gates of Brandenburg in Germany or uh, in New York, it is a bizarre mythology. It cuts off, for example, classical antiquity from its own natural Mediterranean contexts. It cuts off the Hebrew Bible from its own natural context and begins, I sometimes call it the choo-choo train theory of history. It begins in Athens and comes forward to Europe without any interruption, without any, any influence from other cultures, erases its, its other cultures. But there is something equally important. It is not just the West that is a myth and is a fabrication. It is a commodified ideological fetish. It is classical out of the uh, first volume of, of Karl Marx. Edward was not a Marxist. He, he was a literary theorist, and he came through to this idea through the ingenuity of his thinking about the, what, what the hell is this West? But it is a period of capitalist modernity when f commodity is fetishized, and the West becomes the ideological commodification of this thing called the West. And not only itself is a, is a fetish and a, as a myth, anything that it touches is gutted out of its historical complexity. Islam, China, India, whatever you put next to this West is gutted out of its historical complexity and becomes an illusion just like the West. So, but the fact remains that uh, today in the aftermath of all of these a globalization of the of the imperial experience we don't have that epicenter that began, uh, that used to call itself the west the west has imploded and so has all its other binaries but again going back to edward said it was edward's intuitive understanding of this mythology that began all of this discourse that has resulted to our conversation today um he himself of course spoke uh, at, at great personal uh, cost on behalf of the Palestinian people. He himself, of course, was Palestinian. Uh, you have uh, suffered this kind of uh, right-wing cancel culture for doing things which universities should do. I believe you put on a Palestinian film festival. Uh, to raise this uh, truth uh, is not cost-free. Uh, and maybe you can just talk a little, you write about it in your book, talk a little bit about your own experience, which is just appalling. Now, here you are in a university setting, uh, you are uh, uh, curating a Palestinian film festival, and I'll let you go from there. Uh, 
I, as I say in my book, Chris, I was not attracted to Palestine because of uh, Edward Said. I was drawn to Edward Said because of Palestine. My commitment to the Palestinian cause is goes back to my childhood, to my father's socialism and, and uh, labor union activists and, uh, and so forth. So for me to put together a Palestinian film festival when Edward was still with us, and in fact, he gave the, the inaugural uh, keynotes when we opened it back in 2003, just about a year before he passed away, 2002, was very normal. Very, I was teaching a course on Middle Eastern cinema. I had collected a rather unique uh, constellation of Palestinian films, and I wanted to stage it. But putting together a Palestinian film festival in, at Columbia University in the city of New York robbed many people the wrong way because in effect, you were just talking about humanity of a nation, of a people that have art, have culture, have, have uh, poetry, have uh, like everybody else. But that uh, simple suggestion of the humanity of Palestinians, the humanity of Palestinians was not waiting for me, it has to do with prolonged resistance to occupation and eradication as we see it all the way today, became very troubling for many people in this city and this uh, campus. Edward, to, the, to his dying day, thought I was insane to even think of putting together a, a Palestinian film festival. But we persisted. And uh, eventually, around the uh, collection of my uh, Palestinian films, we created an archive, we created a website, we created, uh, I published a book, uh, Dreams of a Nation. And then eventually we establish a center for Palestine studies, the first of its, uh, of its kind. Now, what that tells you is, in fact, you, your own work is a perfect example of it, that there are few who dare the elements. We are what Edward called the naysayers. But these naysayers are all over the, over the country. They, the, the banality of this Republican Democrat kind of uh, uh, seesaw that you see in politics doesn't reflect uh, the reality of what this country is about and goes back all the way back to the 19th century. So I don't think I was unique or I was the only one. Uh, in fact, when we did the Palestinian Film Festival in, 19, uh, in 2003, a close friend of mine uh, who is a graphic artist gave me a poster of a week of solidarity with Palestinian people that a group of Iranian and Arab and American and Turkish students had put together in New York 30 years before me in 1973. So this has always been, but there has not been a manifestation of it. There was no way of registering. There was, there was no way of communicating. I mean, this is again, Edward constantly talks about his frustration that he had to do with, begin with the alphabet of talking about the humanity of Palestinians. So we did that. And I want to. I want to. I want to come. I want to come back to. I'm going to come back to that because I want to talk about what the reaction. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation about Edward Said, Orientalism, and the fiction of empire with Professor Hamid Dabashi. <laughs> Welcome back to On Contact. We continue our conversation about the fictitious ideas of empire and Western civilization with Professor Hamid Dabashi. Uh, I want you to talk about what they, because if you uh, uh, attempt to present a reality that is outside the dominant ruling narrative, you pay. Um, this was the personal attacks that were directed against you, which followed uh, Edward Said throughout his life, were vicious. Uh, camp you can talk about wh what happened. Campus Watch, Liz Cheney puts you on a list of suspicious professors. Uh, your email accounts are spammed. Uh, and let's remember that this is for, uh, I think, by any definition, about honest, intellectual, and artistic inquiry of another culture. I want you to just lay out specifically how they came after you. Uh, to begin with, uh, Chris, we had, uh, I had, so suddenly I had a phone call from the security at Columbia that uh, we need to increase security. I said, for what? They said, because of this festival, people are coming to disrupt it. I said, what do you mean? 
increased security. So, well, we have to have uh, increased security. I said, this is a film festival, it's not a war zone. He said, no, we will have plain clothes. Uh, and then, then uh, my colleague in the security said, but you have to pay for it. I mean, where do I pay for it? How, how do you exactly put together, you, you can't walk into Ford Foundation and give me money for, uh, for a Palestinian film festival. Uh, very meager uh, uh, money that we had. I said, fine, you know, I want to have to go with the, with the film festival, not knowing how I was, I was going to pay for the uh, extra security. But much of it, Chris, is also bluffing. I mean, they project more power than they actually have. But nevertheless, it's very disconcerting and very disrupting. Next thing I know, uh, Campus Watch has put me on a list. Next thing I know, Liz Cheney has put me on another list. A suspicious professor, and it all culminated in this book uh, by, uh, I mean, I, I forget his name, 101 Most Dangerous Professor. I made it to the list of a book called 101 Most Dangerous Professors uh, that me and my colleagues, this, I'm sure you- Is this you... Pipes? Is this, was this Pipes? No, pipes? no, no. Uh, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a body of uh, Pipes. Pipes run the, uh, the uh, campus watch. Uh, Horowitz, David Horowitz was his name. Uh, that probably you're on, you're on that list too. 101 most dangerous professors. What does that mean? It's not the question of intellectual honesty. It, it, it is intimidating. They know for a fact, I don't, I'm not independently wealthy. I live paycheck by paycheck. They want to disrupt your life. They want to disrupt the your life of your family. They want to make sure that make a lesson out of you make you make you uh, so pr fearful for your own life that you shut up. I, of course, and then worst of all, accusing you of your horror of anti-Semitism while anti-Semites are frequent flyers to, uh, to Tel Aviv and uh, active in supporting. I mean, you can't be more anti-Semite than Donald Trump. And Donald Trump was the most active, aggressive, violent pro uh, Israeli uh, pre president perhaps in US history. But then intimidating people to silence, with, especially with the horror of accusation of anti-Semitism, that you have to constantly argue, I am not anti-Semite, I am a critical of Zionism. And in fact, as you probably know, I have written more critical books about Iran than I have about uh, Israel and against Saudi Arabia and against, uh, you name it. I mean, I'm persona non grata anywhere. There is, uh, I have I told my, my colleagues, Name one country, one state apparatus of which I'm not critical. If you can find, I have never singled out Israel for, uh, uh, for criticism. But it, 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 I, I, the, the other side of it is, I was once in London in the office of my, uh, my editor, and I saw a copy of this 101 Most Dangerous Professor. I said, what are you doing with this? He said, I'm trying to see, figure out which one of you we haven't published yet. It has two sides. It is, if you, if you pull out and get fearful and they think they're, they have succeeded, yes, then you're silenced. But if you fight back, knock the wood, in June, I'll be 70 years old. I have been fighting, Chris, as you have. I'm a great fan of your work and admiring your courage uh, all my life. I mean, what, I, it's not a choice that I had. I, I see a horror happening. I see Jared Kushner nominated for uh, for a Nobel Prize. I get, I mean, again, like Edward in his last interview, magnificent interview, he said uh, when he was battling cancer, as you know, uh, he said, "All I need is a picture of Ariel Sharon, and I and I and my blood start boiling, and I <laughs> and I go back and and do." So it is, it is wrong, Chris, as I'm sure you would you would agree, to picture ourselves as victims. It is a vicious fight, but we are fighters. We fight. I fought, fought all of my life. And it is not a fight that I do it consciously. I do it naturally. I do it for Iraq. I do it for Kurds. I do it for Iran. I do it again. It is part of who you are and it is integral to your moral imagination. It's evident in my scholarship. It's not just an article I write or a film festival I put together. Well, it's the Gramscian distinction of whether you're going to be an organic intellectual or a tool of, uh, and Edward, of course, uh, fought uh, those intellectuals who had sold their souls, uh, as you have. Uh, I want to talk about the construct. The reason that people like you or Edward or others are attacked, I think, so viciously is because this truth that you speak about the reality beyond the borders of empire 
and about ourselves is one that obliterates the raison d'etre for empire itself. Uh, so just in a, it, briefly, tell us, the, and Edward of course spends Orientalism uh, doing this uh, with masterful detail, but tell us the, the myth itself, the myth we tell about ourselves, and then importantly, the myth that is always told about those who we dominate. What are those two myths? The, the dominant myth is that Western civilization is God's gift to humanity. There is something uh, uh, pseudo-Christian in this. I, I hesitate to say Christian because liberation theology is also from, in Latin America, comes from Christianity. Your own uh, uh, struggle has a Christian component to it. But there is a kind of a Western Christ, Christian, uh, white Christianity that goes all, of, all the way back to Bartolomeo de las Casas, that this is, uh, this is the responsibility. The, the, uh, the, when you cited Edward Said, the uh, uh, mission to civilize, that is the world is barbaric, the world is gone uh, wrong, and the mission of the white person, white man, is to civilize and liberate. This is the, the responsibility. So it assumes a certain bizarre moral responsibility for the white British in India, for the uh, uh, French in Algeria, for the Belgians in Congo, etc., uh, etc. Et On the other side of it, the, the complexity, the richness, the power of art, culture, humanity, poetry, of the entirety of human beings from Latin America, Africa, Asia, is obliterated. The best of them are stolen from Africa, Latin America, etc., brought to museums here in United States and Europe as preparatory, a sort of infantile a stage of Western civilization. So you, you, there is a cannibalization. There is an intellectual and, and artistic cannibalization of the rest of the world in order to project for yourself the fiction of a teleology, of a Hegelian teleology, that everything that happened before history was only preparatory to come to this seminal uh, uh, moment of history. Now, critique of this was, of course, long before Edward Said. Uh, Max Weber called it uh, uh, iron cage, this, this, this idea, this way of thinking. Marx was critical of it. So it is not just that Edward Said uh, uh, came. Edward Said was building on a much larger intellectual history that came before him. But what is important was, was potent. He laser beamed on the Arab world, on the Oriental world on the, the predicament of the Palestinian. And chapter and verse showed how the construction of this myth of the West was at the expense of dehumanization, of rubbing of humanity of the rest of the world. And as a result, did the preparatory work, which in a book that he did subsequently, Culture and Empire, to see how within the construction of European civilization, it's literary, poetic, artistic, um, uh, musical aspects, you have the remnants of that cannibalization. And of course, uh, Edward was a scholar of Conrad, uh, who in Heart of Darkness and even more perhaps uh, pointedly in his short story, Outpost of Progress, uh, exposed the European colonizers as uh, the true barbarians, which as all of us who have spent uh, as much time as I have on the outer reaches of empire understand. Edward writes, and we'll just close having you comment on this passage, every European in what he could say about the Orient was consequently a racist, an imperialist, and almost totally ethnocentric. Some of the immediate sting will be taken out of these labels if we recall additionally that human societies, at least the more advanced cultures, have rarely offered the individual anything but imperialism, racism, and ethnocentrism for, ethnocentrism for dealing with other cultures. So Orientalism aided and was aided by general cultural pressures that tended to make more rigid the sense of difference between the European and Asiatic parts of the world. My contention is that Orientalism is fundamentally a political doctrine willed over the Orient because the Orient was weaker and the West, which eluded, uh, eluded the Orient's difference with its weakness? Uh, it is important, Chris, to remember the, the very insight that you just cited by Edward, namely the constitution of Europe as the epicenter of humanity and as the zenith of human civilization. 
was done at the expense of, first of all, constitution of something called Oriental. I suddenly, as an Iranian, as a human being rooted in one of the oldest civilization on planet Earth, was robbed of my historicity and I became an Oriental. And I do, I, to this day, I have no clue what's an Oriental. Well, how am I supposed to behave to be, to be an, an Oriental? Uh, if, uh, a few years ago, somebody in Arizona with a thick Southern accent told me, I do detect a little bit of accent talking to me. I said, well, I do detect a little bit of accent in you too. You hear my own, my accent, but you don't hear your own accent. Everybody has an accent. This is what I, what, what, but it was done also to Native Americans. It was also done to African Americans. Edward's uh, insight into the constitution of the Oriental is identical with James Baldwin, with W.E.B. Du Bois, yeah. with all of these giants of intellectuals of, uh, of, of African American experience, with the idea that W.E.B. Du Bois called uh, double consciousness of, of African Americans. We too, we, we were create the way we saw ourselves. I'm following from W.E.B. Du Bois revolutionary insight and the way that Europeans told us how we are. So we need to place Edward Said in a larger frame of reference. Yes, his insight was exceptionally revolutionary, liberating, not just people in the Arab and Muslim world, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the whole movement of subaltern studies, but also bring it back to the United States and experience that today we see in Black Lives Matter, in Native American uh, history, uh, etc. Great. We're going to stop there. Uh, that was Professor Hamid Dabashi about his new book on Edward Said, Remembrance of Things Past. <laughs>